Well, welcome everyone. Delighted to be here to, uh, to welcome you to uh, uh, tonight's uh, annual Tanner uh, McCurran uh, lecture. Looking forward to uh, uh, what I think will be a thoughtful presentation by our, uh, our guest lecturer. Uh, just based on the conversation with them uh, outside, I'm very confident of that. Fascinating set of topics. I'm Dan Reed. I'm the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at the University of Utah. Uh, on behalf of you and also uh, Westminster College, delighted to welcome you all here today. This is a timely and thoughtful topic. As I was reflecting today uh, prior to coming over here, we live in a time of accelerating change. And we as humans are reasonably good at linear extrapolation. Tomorrow mostly looks like today. And most of our social structures historically have been predicated on the notion that slow change uh, occurred on a generational basis. And so uh, it was possible to adapt. When dramatic change occurs in a handful of years, whether it be social disruptions, technical disruptions, economic disruptions, we struggle much more to adapt. So how we reason thoughtfully about those issues uh, in terms of policy, the ethics, the social consensus about norms and behavior bring new challenges in a world of accelerating change. And that's why I think this lecture is both so timely and relevant. Uh, and so I welcome you all today, as I said, on both behalf of the U and also on behalf of Westminster. And with that, let me turn the podium over to our ne new dean. Um, I keep saying new. It won't be new at some point, uh, but our new dean of the Quinney College of Law, um, Professor Elizabeth Gronk Warner. Good evening. As our Senior Vice President Dan Reed mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner and I have the great privilege of being Dean of the SJ Quinney College of Law and it is my extreme pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's event. Like Dr. Reed, I am very excited for tonight's event as the question of ethics in this increasingly global world is a topic that comes up in a variety of areas, as I believe Dr. Rosenthal will demonstrate through his three case studies in his presentation tonight. As our world changes changes more rapidly than ever before, these advancements bring unprecedented ethical crises that impact you and every other person on this planet. So I'm very excited to hear what Dr. Rosenthal has to say on the topic. Um, we are particularly excited to host Dr. Rosenthal as he is the president of the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. And as you may know, the Carnegie Council is the celebrated home of national thought leaders and policy experts on global ethical issues. And uh, Dr. Rosenthal is their leader, so he is the best among the best. Um, we are thankful for Dr. Rosenthal, Rosenthal and his initiatives have allowed many of our students here at the University of Utah um, to participate as Carnegie Student Fellows, so we appreciate those opportunities as well. Before I turn it over um, to Professor Dean Chatterjee to talk a little bit about our speaker and give you more information on Dr. Rosenthal, I do want to share a little bit of history about this lecture series. The Tanner McMurrin Lectures on History and Philosophy of Religion were established by the Westminster College of Salt Lake City in 1987 as a means of bringing major scholars in the fields of history, philosophy, uh, of religion to deliver public lectures and to conduct seminars on basic issues in religious thought and practice. We are particularly honored here today to be hosting this event in coordination with Mes Westminster College and to have their pro t uh, provost, who's also new, um, here with us as well. So thank you so much to Westminster College. The lectureship is funded in perpetuity by an endowment gift from the late Dr. Obert Clark Tanner, formerly a professor emeritus of philosophy at the University of Utah, and the late Grace Adams Tanner. The lectureship is named in honor of Dr. Sterling M. McMurrin, who was the E.E. E. Erickson Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of Utah, and a former U.S. Commissioner of Education. Dr. McMurrin was a trustee emeritus of Westminster College, hence the relationship between our two fine institutions. So we are therefore very honored to co-host this event with Westminster College, and it is therefore also my extreme pleasure to hand over uh, now the podium to uh, Professor Dean Chatterjee, who is the, uh, 
the man behind the event. Thank you, Dean Warner, for your kind comments, and thank you, our senior, senior Vice President, Dr. Dan Reed, for being here, welcoming all of us. We appreciate that very much. And I would like to also acknowledge some uh, notable folks from our Westminster College, as, you know, in fact, already mentioned uh, in the prior introductions, we have the Provost of the College, Dr. Devi Tamasabi, who is here, along with also our Dean Lance Newman, and also Dean Richard Badenhausen, and others. And most importantly, I would like to acknowledge Professor Michael Popich, sitting over here, who has been the director of the Tanner McMurray Lecture, and through his support and help and everything, that we have made this collaborative event between Westminster and our law college possible. So we thank all of them. Uh, but we also mm, I regret that President Beth Dobkin of Westminster College couldn't come here today, and she sends us her regrets. Uh, so before I introduce the speaker, just one or two words about uh, where we are going. Uh, we live in this globalized world, and yet it's a very turbulent, turbulent world. As the world is getting smaller, the divides seem to be get more pronounced. Hence, we have a great need to explore the prospects of collective action and value-based dialogue in a divided world where norms clash. The lecture title fits well with this concern, Ethics for a Connected World, three cases that impact you, covering the, natural, covering the three, uh, three areas of natural world, the virtual world, and the political world. <clears throat> of course, there is no better person to speak on this topic than Dr. Joel Rosenthal, who is president of Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. As Dean Warner mentioned, you know, that council is the home of the global thought leaders on ethics in international affairs, and Dr. Rosenthal, of course, is the president of the council. We are honored to have him today for delivering this year's Tanner McMillan Lecture. Dr. Rosenthal received his PhD from Yale University and a BA from Harvard University. As a scholar and teacher, Dr. Rosenthal has focused on ethics in US foreign policy with special emphasis on issues of war and peace, human rights, and pluralism. Dr. Rosenthal is also an adjunct professor at NYU, New York University, and chairman of the Bard College of Globalization and International Affairs, uh, that program in New York City, as well as a Dorset Fellow at Dartmouth College. His numerous national and international awards include the Distinguished Scholar Award from the International Studies Association for his lifetime achievement in international studies and an honorary degree from a degree of Doctor of Social Science from the University of Edinburgh. He is the editor-in-chief of the Carnegie Council's flagship journal, Ethics and International Affairs, published by Cambridge University, and its articles have appeared over 1,100 times in hundreds of university syllabi in 28 countries. With this brief but incomplete introduction, I am proud to invite, very pleased to invite Dr. Rosenthal here to deliver his talk, Ethics in a Connected World. Dr. Rosenthal. <clears throat> thank you, deans. Uh, thank you to Westminster College. Uh, thank you to this university, to this law school, uh, and most of, all, most of all to my to my friend, the other dean, Dean Chatterjee. Um, I'm really honored to, to be here. I'm also honored, Dean, to be your friend. Uh, one of my first ethics teachers uh, in high school <clears throat> uh, gave me a little lesson, and uh, he said, 
Look at your friends, and that's who you are. And I consider you, Dean, one of my closest friends, and I admire you so much for all the work that you do. Um, hope next time maybe I can introduce you and give you that, that, that resume and that biography. It's really incredible what you've accomplished, not only in your personal life, but your professional life. So thank you for this invitation to be here. Um, my wife, Pat, is here, and uh, we got off the airplane from New York uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, and um, those of you who live here and have been here a long time may forget the effect that it has to leave the East Coast and get off the plane in Salt Lake City, just as the rain is moving out and the sun is coming out. Uh, and it's a beautiful day today, and uh, it's just really inspiring uh, to be here and to see this great university and to meet so many uh, um, young, accomplished students and um, aspiring academicians and a university that's really facing the world. So all of a sudden I sort of feel at home. So uh, it's great, it's great uh, to be here. Uh, now I know they say, um, like on the airlines, I know you had a choice of uh, where to be tonight. And um, uh, I know that there is a sort of, a, I've heard that there's some debate going on or whatever. Um, so I thought I would use this maybe as an opportunity to announce my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. I was speaking to somebody last night and said, well, that sounds like a great idea, you ought to try that out. And he said, how about right, run as a Republican? Make it interesting. So anyway, but again, thank you all for your attention. I'm gonna speak for about, I think about 45 minutes or so and hope we'll have time for <clears throat> question and answer. So this lecture, by the way, um, I'm glad I have the chance to share it with you because it's, it's sort of a work in progress. And it started three years ago as a series of observations, and it came together as a result of structured conversations we've been having at Carnegie Council in New York about trends in world politics. And here's what we found. Over the past three years, two stories have ended. Two narratives have collapsed. The first story is the story of internationalism, the liberal order of a rules-based system based on shared values is in retreat. We came to know this system by the institutions it created, the UN, NATO, IMF, World Bank, WTO, the Brexiteers, followed by Donald Trump, tapped on the glass and it cracked. The post-World War II world we once knew is fragmented, weakened, and fighting for its life. The second story is the story of democracy itself, threatened by nationalists and strongmen riding a new wave of authoritarian rule with leaders ascendant like Putin, Xi, Erdogan, Modi, Orban, Kim, Duterte, and perhaps even Trump, it is fair to ask if democracy too is in retreat, if not severely weakened. These two stories of internationalism and democracy, once our bedrock, once our true north, are not only in peril, these stories need to be rewritten. This was our most important finding. What I wanna talk with you about today is how we might go about rewriting these stories, or at the very least, how we might construct a counter narrative to the dissolving principles of internationalism and democracy. So to give away my ending right up front, here's my idea for the new story. Just as our politics are fragmenting, we are realizing our most dangerous threats and our greatest opportunities are global in scale. In today's world, coordinated action informed by democratic participation makes sense not only as a matter of preference for certain values over others, coordinated action is quite literally a matter of survival. So I'm gonna be showing you a few images as I go along to tell my story here. Just by show of hands, how many people know who this is? 
I showed this to a group of students and there were blank looks. This is a picture of Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown is the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and he served as Prime Minister, I believe, 2007 or 8 through 2010, roughly in that time frame. So the point I'm about to relay to you actually came to me in an aha moment. In a, I had an opportunity to sit with um, the former Prime Minister and we were talking about these issues. So he told me, he said, when I was Prime Minister, I faced four critical issues. The first issue was the global financial crisis of 2008. This was a full-blown, real-time, urgent crisis, fast-moving. The world economy was literally collapsing. And in managing this event, he realized as the head of state that his treasurer, the chancellor of the exchequer, uh, the most important figures like the chair of the Bank of England, they would not be able to deal with this crisis on their own, as capable and as strong as they may have been in their positions. Without Washington, New York, Hong Kong, Singapore, and others, the United Kingdom's economic situation would be dire. That was his first problem. Next problem. The second ch challenge was national security, still framed, again, in 2008, 9, 10, by the post-9-11 concerns, terrorism, and managing the aftermath of the war in Iraq and ongoing operations in Afghanistan. The United Kingdom was heavily involved in global counterterrorism against Al-Qaeda and other networks. Yet as much confidence as the Prime Minister had in the armed forces of the United Kingdom, and in Scotland Yard, and all of those apparatus, their efforts depended on integration with NATO, Interpol, and other security and intelligence gathering networks overseas. Third problem. Third challenge was um, the Prime Minister's responsibility to prepare his country for the climate summit that was convened in Copenhagen in December 2009. This was the precursor to the Paris, Peace, uh, Paris Climate Summit in 2015? 16, can't remember, 16. So the Copenhagen uh, Summit was coming up. The Prime Minister was very proud of his country's leadership in reducing carbon emissions and taking measures to improve the record, its record on sustainability. And yet he realized that any meaningful progress on climate change would require a global effort. The United Kingdom is a nation of 65 million people on a planet of over 7 billion. The United Kingdom could lead by example, but meaningful success on mitigating climate change would require cooperation. Fourth and final. The final challenge was one of personal interest to uh, the Prime Minister, and this was uh, global development. Once again, here was an area in which he felt the government of his country under his leadership was doing its part with significant and relatively effective overseas development policies. Yet the UK efforts were a drop in the ocean. Effective remedies to deal with billions of people living on less than $2 billion a day would require a global grand strategy. As you may know, Prime Minister Brown went on to work with Malala the Pakistani student who showed great courage in asserting her right to an education. With Brown's support, Malala's example was celebrated at the United Nations and became a rally point for increasing opportunities for women and girls. So the Prime Minister and I ended our conversation in agreement that global problems would require global solutions, and these solutions would require consensus on a new global ethic. And here was the crucial point. And he was saying this to me as a head of state or former head of state. Old school views of national interest would be insufficient. Okay, so fast forward to today. 
So here's the problem. The problem, of course, is that everything's going the other way. Globalism should not be a bad word, but in many quarters, it is. Globalism has traditionally been the province of idealists, but if I understood the prime minister correctly, those days are over. Globalism is now the requirement for realists. Self-interest now demands a globalization of politics and therefore of ethics. The real challenge of our time is reversing the tide of nationalism and especially ethno-nationalism. How do we make globalism a project for realists and pragmatists? Now, a major challenge for those of us emphasizing cooperation over conflict is getting over the label of idealist. How do we escape the tint of utopianism? Globalism is easily caricatured, like coexist bumper stickers and charges of new age dreaming. And these charges, I would say, are not without some merit. Think of the string of failures at world governance, beginning with the League of Nations running through today's impotent United Nations. We've somehow come to a place where globalism and international cooperation is an elite project foisted on the masses by both naive forces on the one hand, led by one-worlders like Marianne Williamson and her New Age friends, and malign forces on the other hand, led by corporate and financial titans like George Soros. In my view, the antidote or the counter-narrative should be a version of realism itself. Realism has a great pedigree. We have a lot to work with, and there's no better exemplar than Adam Smith, the founder of the modern discipline of economics. Smith is best known for his tract on mercantilism, which turns into a version of nationalism, called The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. But his first and most important book was The Theory of Moral Sentiments, published in 1759. The first chapter of The Theory of Moral Sentiments is titled, Of Sympathy. And if there's any doubt in your mind that economics was founded as a moral discipline, I urge you to pick up a copy of Moral Sentiments and just read the first chapter. Smith argues that exchange depends on mutuality and reciprocity. Fast forward to today, I believe that Smith would take one look at our current circumstances and conclude that the real naivete today is with those who don't understand interdependence, those who don't see the shared destiny of our globally connected world. Some more modern thinking on this current best-selling author, Yuval Harari. He writes in his new book, 21 Challenges for the 21st Century, quote, humankind has little choice but to complement local loyalties with substantial obligations to the global community. A person can be loyal to family, neighborhood, profession, nation, as well as to mankind and planet Earth. Harari would say, conflicts between the local and global will be inevitable, but such conflicts are the human condition. And he says simply in his chapter on this, he says simply, he just writes, deal with it. Deal with it. The direction we're going is unmistakable. In fact, I would go further to argue that the global-local distinction is breaking down. In understanding this new relationship between global trends and your lived experience, is where the action is. Last one on this. Many of you will recognize the work of Kwame Anthony Appiah. Um, I believe he was a lecturer in this series and he's been here before, an inspiration to many of us with his theory or his idea of rooted cosmopolitanism, uh, that it's a false choice to think that we must be loyal to our, our nation or the world, that we can um, be both together. You see this quote here. Um, the challenge is to take minds and hearts formed over the long millennia and living in local troops 
and equip them with ideas and institutions that will allow us to live together as the global tribe we have become. And so this, this is the setup that I want to give you and now pivot into these three areas that I promised about how these ideas actually affect you. And as Dean said in his introduction, as made clear in the title here, I want to look at three particular areas, and I'm actually going to give you two brief case studies in each. Um, I want to look at the natural world, the virtual world, and the political world, and suggest that each presents a new frontier for ethics. Each of these areas is very much with us locally, present in our individual lives, even as the scope expands globally. So let's go into the natural world. Human intervention into the natural world is as old as human history. Yet in the 20th and 21st century, and as this advances, science and technology has been truly revolutionary, and we're now in the age of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene makes one, makes one important thing clear. We have entered a new geological age. Think about that, a new geological age, a fundamentally different age. Humans now have complete dominion over nature. The splitting of the atom unleashed a new era in weapons and energy. The discovery of DNA unlocked the mystery of life itself, giving us the capacity to alter all forms of life from plants to animals to human beings. We are now a planet of over seven billion people Human activity is now the determinant factor on what happens to planet Earth. So here's my first case. This is a slide of uh, human genome, a slide of human DNA. I would submit that the most important discovery of the 20th century was the discovery of the double helix by Watson and Crick in the 1950s. The most dramatic example of human intervention in nature today is the development of CRISPR technology. CRISPR is a gene editing technology that can be used to prevent and treat diseases by inactivating genes in cell lines and opening the door to genetic engineering of human beings. Now this is a, rough, a relatively simple technology that allows physicians to turn genes on and off as well as alter the basic structure in the germline, which means that changes could be passed down to the next generation. Why is this urgent? Well, in 2018, Dr. He Zhang of China used CRISPR technology to edit the genomes of twin girls. These were human embryos that were um, gene edited by Dr. Hay. I'm going to quote you a paragraph from the journal Nature. By engineering mutations into human embryos, which were then used to produce babies, Dr. Hay leapt capriciously into an era in which science could rewrite the gene pool of future generations by altering the human germline. Hay also flouted established norms for safety and human protection along the way. That's the end of the quote. Now, I'm sure you all can think of your own, but there are several ethical issues that arise from this case. The first, of course, is the act itself, altering the genetic code of an embryo with unknown consequences for the baby to follow, as well as for the baby's eventual offspring. The second is the fact that there are no codified norms, standards, or laws to guide, regulate, and govern this new technology. Of special interest to me is that there may be significant cultural differences to account for in developing a common approach. Chinese and Western scientists and physicians may look at the assets and liabilities differently. There have been some high-level expert panels convened to begin discussion of these issues, and plans have been floated, uh, floated to uh, form a transnational advisory body to identify common norms as well as differences of opinion. 
However, the fact remains that this is an essentially ungoverned space with only nascent international dialogue. Genetic engineering is a true frontier for ethical debate over basic issues such as the rights of embryos as subject of experimentation, the responsibility for unintended consequences, equity in distributing the potential benefits of future gene therapies, obligations to future generations. How do we weigh the potential benefits of disease eradication and the enhancement of human well-being against the potential risks known and unknown? Second, my second example in the natural world, geoengineering, our ability to engineer the climate. Just as climate is warmed by human activity, we now have technology that can cool the climate. Basically, two types of technologies that can be used to cool the climate. One is carbon removal or carbon sequestration, and the other is called solar radiation modification, which is essentially deflecting solar rays by various means away from the Earth. At Carnegie Council, we decided to sponsor uh, a working group on this, uh, the Climate Geoengineering, Geoengineering Governance Initiative, to address these new technologies and what they might mean for all of us. It's our belief that research and potential deployment of either large-scale carbon removal or solar radiation modification should be guided, regulated, and governed in such a way as to maximize benefits and minimize risk, as well as to ensure costs and benefits um, are justly distributed. I was looking for a slide that would show the global thermostat. All I could find was a conventional one. But here's the question. Who, control, who controls the global thermostat, right? If we have the technology to cool the climate, how's that going to go? This is the way our, our, our climate team puts it. Sooner rather than later, policymakers around the world will need to confront an uncomfortable reality that despite the best efforts of national governments and thousands of mayors and other civic leaders, we can no longer contain global average temperature to below 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. The climate is going to warm to unacceptable levels. Given the increasing tempo of the crisis, it's becoming more likely that a group of countries or cities or even one or more wealthy individuals might decide to deploy geoengineering technologies during the coming decades. This raises obvious questions. How would we govern such actors? Who assesses the balance of risks and rewards when deploying geoengineering technologies? What safeguards and what compensation mechanisms need to be built in? If we start deliberately alter, altering global temperatures, who controls the global thermostat? There are a range of principles that could be considered for the governance of geoengineering. These would include precaution, first do no harm, right? Transparency, intergenerational equity, inter international cooperation research, uh, and research as a public good. But again, we get to this governance question. The reality is that as the climate warms, these technologies are likely to be used or more likely to be used. Some think very likely to be used. Serious questions need to be asked and answered now. Perhaps we need a UN level global forum to begin a process of analysis followed by action. And on the agenda would be several questions. For example, should there be a moratorium or banning of certain kinds of research? Should criteria be established for the development and potential deployment of 
climate cooling technologies? What can or should be done if lone actors begin to surface? Should some kind of intergovernmental body be established to sort out this coming policy challenge? For me, it's hard to imagine effective governance without a prior dialogue on some of the ethical principles that are in play. Okay, so that's the natural world. I hope in Q&A we can have a chance to discuss um, some of these questions I've raised. Virtual world. When I was thinking about the world in 2019, thinking in maybe 100 year sort of periods, I think the virtual world would be the sort of the hardest thing to describe to the folks in uh, 1919. Would they really be able to understand what we mean um, by uh, the virtual world? You know, you, some of you may know this quote, the internet is a series of tubes. Uh, this is actually a direct quote from a United States Senator who was having a little, a little trouble uh, understanding what the virtual world is. But I think maybe for all of you in this class, um, in this room, uh, the virtual world may be the thing that's the most present um, in, in, your daily, in your daily life, proving that the global is not something that's out there, it's something right here. Um, the virtual world, I, and for the purposes of this conversation, I sort of raise about sort of three, I'm sorry, four kind of um, um, categories. Uh, in it, I include uh, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, uh, uh, capacities for surveillance uh, and cyberspace itself. And the power of these forces to shape our lives is enormous and growing all the time. So a couple of examples in um, the virtual world. Virtual world issues have all become international issues and this was underlined to me by the fact that the grand elder statesman of international politics 95-year-old Henry Kissinger, who really in some ways defines the field of world politics and international relations, has now devoted considerable time to this issue, which by definition makes it an international relations issue. Kissinger argues that the virtual world represents the changing terrain for the art of diplomacy and the practice of foreign policy, and it cannot be ignored. In a recent article in the Atlantic magazine titled how the Enlightenment Ends, think about that title, How the Enlightenment Ends, Kissinger turned his attention to the revolutionary changes of AI. I'll quote you a, a couple of paragraphs from the article. The Enlightenment started with an essentially philosophical, essential philosophical insights which were spread by a new technology, the printing press. Our period is moving in the opposite direction it has generated a potentially dominating technology in search of a guiding philosophy. Where will AI be in five years? What will be the impact on human cognition generally? What is the role of ethics in this process, which consists in essence of the acceleration of choices? And whenever I see Henry Kissinger writing the word ethics, I pay attention. <laughs> Um, so I'll give you one of the examples that Kissinger talks about in the article, and, and you'll all have your own examples, but I hope this just is sort of a prompt to you. Um, science fiction has imagined scenarios of AI turning on its creators. More likely is the danger that AI will misinterpret human instruction due to its inherent lack of context. A famous recent example was the AI chatbot called Tay, designed to generate friendly conversation in the language patterns of a 19-year-old woman. But the machine proved unable to define the imperatives of friendly and reasonable language installed by its instructors and instead became racist, sexist, and otherwise inflammatory in its responses. It lacked the nuances of language. Now, some in the technology world claim that this experiment was ill-conceived and poorly executed, but it does illustrate an underlying ambiguity. To what extent is it possible to enable AI to comprehend the context that informs its instructions? K 
Kissinger's title, How the Enlightenment Ends, signals his concern that human values, the human experience, may be pushed aside unless there is purposeful resistance to the authority of the algorithm and the cloud. My second example in the cyber world is um, from uh, the president of Microsoft, uh, Brad Smith. And this is, uh, uh, well, I think we all know from personal experience the hazards of the relatively ungoverned area of cyberspace. Cyber attacks occur daily, often with disastrous consequences for individuals, corporations, and municipalities across the United States and around the world. Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, has a solution for all of us civilians out there on the cyber frontier. In order to prevent civilian casualties, that means you being hacked, I guess, he has proposed a digital Geneva Convention. According to Brad Smith, and I quote, governments continue to invest in greater offensive capabilities in cyberspace and nation state attacks on civilians are on the rise. The world needs, a new, inter needs new international rules to protect the public from nation state threats and cyberspace. In short, the world needs a digital Geneva Convention Although no international agreement is ever perfect, the world has already benefit from other, benefited from other global covenants, the Treaty on the Nonproliferation of Nuclear Weapons and the Chemical Weapons Convention are both examples of the international community coming together to effectively manage weapons with potential to create catastrophic harm. A digital Geneva Convention would create a legally binding framework to govern states' behavior in cyberspace. While there is a need for, for urgency and even high ambition, steps can be taken incrementally. And such an agreement would include a pledge to ref refrain from attacking private civilians, a pledge to refrain from attacking targets that would affect the health and safety of civilian populations, a pledge to refrain from stealing intellectual property a pledge of total res, uh, restraint in the development and use of cyber weapons, a pledge of assistance uh, to the private sector in detecting, containing, and responding and recovering from cyber attacks. And as Brad Smith puts it in his tagline, these pledges amount to a great slogan, 100% defense, 0% offense those of us in the virtual world should pledge that we will protect and not, and not attack. So this was very appealing to me for, uh, my, for many reasons, focusing on this governance side because of its kind of historical, um, um, the, the historical analogy that we have to, to the, the, the Geneva Conventions. And as Smith says, we should recognize that there is a shared responsibility. I'm sorry, uh, let's see what I got. Essentially what Brad Smith says is that, um, the, that we've had this example in the past with the formation of the Geneva Conventions. Historically, um, the world went to Geneva in the 19th century to deal with new firearms, uh, with the, with the um, idea of industrial war. Uh, this was the founding of the Red Cross, the beginning of the humanitarian movement, uh, and there was significant agreement by world powers uh, to codify certain rules and norms. And we should take the example of the original Geneva Convention from the 1800s. It was then modified later uh, in the middle after World War II, uh, middle of the 20th century. And we ought to be thinking of a new Geneva Convention uh, for uh, the virtual world so that we have this um, historical concept and this historical idea to draw from. Okay, moving now into the political world. So if Gordon Brown were prime minister today, I think one of the biggest issues he would be facing is the global refugee and migration crisis. Perhaps no other issue in international politics today makes the point about interconnectivity more than the movement of people. 
The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees compiles statistics on global forced displacement. This number of forcibly displaced people was 59 million in 2014. In 2018, it was 68 million. The Syrian and Le uh, Libyan uh, civil wars put a dramatic focus on this issue, turning the long simmering trend into a full-blown crisis. The reaction, as we all know, was loud and controversial. The issue of border control figured heavily in the Brexit vote, which remains unresolved to this day. And in the United States, of course, President Trump continues his campaign for a wall as he threatens to close the border between the United States and Mexico. So what can be done? My own view is that border control is essential, but there is so much more that can and should be done. And here I wanted to make reference to a previous lecture that was given uh, in this lecture series. This is Michael Doyle, a uh, professor at Columbia University, uh, and who is the author or the principal uh, originator of the Draft Model International Mobility Convention. And uh, Professor Doyle describes the convention in this way. While people are as mobile as they ever were in our globalized world, the movement of people across borders lacks global regulation. This leaves many refugees in protracted displacement and many migrants unprotected in irregular and dire situations. Meanwhile, some states have become concerned that their borders have now become irrelevant. International mobility, the movement of individuals across borders for any length of time, as visitors, students, tourists, labor migrants, entrepreneurs, long-term residents, asylum seekers, or refugees has no common definition or legal framework. And to address this key gap in international law, the growing gaps in protection and responsibility that are leaving people vulnerable, the Model International Mobility Convention proposes a framework for mobility with goals of reaffirming the existing rights afforded to mobile people and the corresponding rights and responsibilities of states, as well as expanding those rights where warranted. And in the interest of time, I'm going to telescope some of this, and you can um, probably see Michael's lecture um, on the YouTube channel, uh, and you can look up the International uh, Mobility Convention. But what's most appealing about this is not only the suggestion of a framework, but the suggestion of some practical measures that can be taken to, um, to improve the current broken system uh, that we have now. And as Professor Doyle uh, explains, there are many opportunities to pool risk, responsibilities, and resources to create better outcomes. And by creating a better system, there will be more incentives to comply with rules, norms, and standards that need to evolve to meet the current circumstances. My last example before I conclude, my last example in the second in the political world is nuclear weapons and the need to confront the challenge of nuclear proliferation. Um, anytime I have the opportunity to discuss the important uh, global challenges, uh, my fear is that the uh, ongoing challenge of uh, the presence of nuclear weapons and the possibilities of nuclear uh, proliferation are falling off the agenda, and we need to constantly be reminded that we live with nuclear weapons and in a nuclear world. The image that you see behind me uh, is an image of uh, four elder statesmen. Uh, from left to right is former Secretary of Defense William Perry, uh, former Senator Sam Nunn, former Secretary of State George Shultz, you see President Obama, and you see Henry Kissinger on the far right. What's remarkable about this group of uh, elder statesmen, these were all of the most important defense and security officials uh, in the Cold War era. Uh, once they, they finished their terms of office, they came to an, a startling, startling agreement that they had to form a group to uh, basically 
pushed the idea of the eradication of nuclear weapons. The, the initiative is called Global Zero, and the operating group that they uh, have been working with is called the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Uh, and uh, that's a very ambitious agenda, uh, especially if you know the history of these gentlemen and what they were involved with in, in, in their public lives as security officials. So the Global Zero Action Plan uh, is, is quite uh, ambitious. Uh, again, coming from, from these people, uh, advocating a phased and verified elimination of nuclear weapons by 2030, um, shining a spotlight on the, the spending over a trillion dollars per decade on the cost of nuclear weapons, um, talking about the possibilities of um, continuing the process of removal of all U.S. and Russian tactical nuclear weapons from Europe. Again, the tide is going the wrong way there. Uh, and also calling for vast reductions. I had one paragraph here just to share with you. Here's their logic. 30 years ago, there were 70,000 nuclear weapons on the planet. Today, there's an estimated 14,500 nuclear weapons, so that direction is good. By 2030, we could remove all nuclear weapons from military service and consign them to the dustbin of history. Enlightened self-interest makes this collective action solution almost self-evident. What is needed is education and a change of mindset. And that's what I want to conclude with now. So, I hope I've persuaded you that we live in a connected world, in the natural world, the virtual world, the political world, and these examples have something in common. They all suggest a pragmatic, pluralistic, problem-solving approach. Now, the local will never be replaced, but in today's world, the local is different. It's shaped by connectivity that is now inescapable. And I suggest that we should think about three principles that would continue to offer guidance as we try to answer the ethics question. That ethics question, the ultimate ethics question, is how should we live? Briefly, my, my three principles. The first principle is pluralism. And I try to define it here. Respect for differences while recognizing what is common in humanity. We share something common by being human. And we must respect this commonality as well as leaving space for differences of values and lifestyle. As the great philosopher of pluralism, Isaiah Berlin, would remind us, there are multiple ways to live a good life. And therefore, we must reject the quest for certainty and uniformity while respecting and embracing differences in our search for this common ground that we must, we must find. My second principle is rights. That is, the way I define it, is protections and entitlements that we all have as human beings, as well as corresponding duties and responsibilities. When asked for his contribution to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, Gandhi wrote a very short letter to the Philosopher's Committee that was assembled to write the draft. The quote from Gandhi, this was the, his summary of wisdom on this rights question. One sentence. I learned from my illiterate but wise mother that all rights to be deserved and preserved came from duty well done. All rights that to be deserved and preserved came from duty well done. No rights without responsibilities. Finally, fairness. Third principle of fairness, giving every person their just due in enabling human flourishing. The best outcome of all is to enable each individual person to realize their, few, their full human capabilities, and this demands some measure of equity and reciprocity. 
The Jewish philosopher Hillel is often given credit for his version of the golden rule. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. And that's the beginning of fairness, if not the end. But we also have more modern guidelines to lean on, including the work of John Rawls, Amartya Sen, and other moral philosophers, exploring the contours of social justice in the contemporary world. And we should use them. Finally, keeping human-focused values at the center of our concern will not happen automatically. It will require direct attention and intention. The goals are to keep human agency alive, to empower individuals to be able to think and act for themselves. We should not become slaves to the market or technology. We should also be thinking about the systems in which we live. We live in, a human designed, we live in human designed institutions according to human values. We should be critical of both and change them when necessary. The slide I've given you here is the image of sailing upwind. And it's an image that's helpful to me as I imagine the process of constructing an ethics for a connected world. It's an iterative process. It requires back and forth. It requires trial and error. It requires shift in direction. It will require trade-offs and the acceptance of imperfections. Democracy itself ensures that we will have a say in how our new world develops. So the next narrative depends on many voices being heard including yours. So as we move toward the future, the ethics piece will be central because it establishes the goals, the true north, and it helps us reflect on the means to get there. If the line is not straight, that's okay as long as we have a strong sense of direction. Thank you all, you've been very attentive and I really appreciate it. Dr. Rosenthal, thank you so much for visiting us and for your excellent talk this evening. Thank you. <clears throat> I noticed that uh, in each of your very well chosen examples, um, we come around uh, each time to the question of authority, be it bio or, um, AI, regulation of the internet, and so on. Um, and I'm wondering, um, what kind of structure do you see this authority taking? Uh, the philosopher, Car so as a spectrum, the philosopher Carol Gould presents uh, an idea that we can have these sort of cross-border constellations that can constitute a world government and contrasts that with one that's highly centralized. And I'm just wondering, when it comes to the structure of that authority, how do you see the most fruitful way forward? Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you very much. Right, and I do think that the sort of the, the idea of world politics and in some ways is shifting. <clears throat> and really where some of the action is, is more functional. So if we want to take, for example, the gene editing issue, um, one way to think about the development of norms, and standards, and perhaps governance, is to be thinking about the actual the players in that system. So those would be research scientists, phys physicians, um, hospitals, healthcare systems, and so on, the actual players in it, and also thinking in a networked and functional way. Um, and so, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, Anne-Marie Slaughter, to put this in the political science terms, has been talking about network theory, right? And that's where, the, where things really happen in sort of horizontal networks. This is sub-state. And um, I think that that's really the, the direction especially for some of these technical problems, difficult problems, um, again, shifting over now maybe to cyber, again, the major players there are, you know, Brad Smith is Microsoft, right? He's not a state, uh, he's not a state player, he's asking the states to join in, but the impetus is actually coming from industry, from civil society, 
from you know, consumers um, you know, forming a functional network to sort of solve this particular, uh, this particular problem. So I think it's an exciting frontier. Uh, how that gets worked out moving forward is, um, will be challenging, but that seems to be the direction. Again, Dr. Rosenthal, thank you very much for the presentation. You. you talked about at the beginning this idea of realism kind of being a basis for this and maybe mutually assured survival right. instead of mutually assured uh, destruction. Knowing it's a work in progress, how do you connect that idea of mutually assured survival or, or you know, our concern about survival of us and the natural world to your three guiding principles at the end, pluralism, fairness, uh, and... Uh, you know, and the last one I'm blanking on right now, but... Uh, rights, just, yeah. Yeah, rights. Because, yes. I mean, those are philosophically complex ideas that are not agreed upon in any way, even if we do agree on survival. So where's kind of the connection between those? No, that's, a great, that's a great question, and I think it comes back to um, thinking about um, when, you come, when you use the term realism, you're talking about interests. So that's the place where it lands for me. And the argument that I'm trying to make is that my own belief is that ethics is connected in, 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 in an intrinsic way to how people begin to understand what their interests are. And my argument with a lot of international relations theorists is that they'll say interests are fixed in some way. And what I would say is, no, interests are constructed. Interests are what we say they are. And as we think about what our interests are, those interests should evolve and they should change. And that's where those principles come in. So we live in a pluralistic world. We need to find what's common. We have a common, we have a common lived experience, but there's also com something common in our humanity. Um, rights, again, I, I'm a universalist. I believe that there are certain protections and entitlements all humans have. But again, in, in fairness as well, I, I, see that, I see it coming together in the construction of interests. And, that, and I see ethics as not something that um, takes us away from our interests or makes us transcend our interests, but actually e ethics is sort of good health in a way. It's about self-fulfillment. And But I do think that the, the real action is, is to have some evolution of how we think about what our interests are. And that's where those principles come in. I should work that. That's the next lecture, I guess, <laughs> to sort of have a better integration. Thank you for that question. Thanks for the talk. It was yes. very interesting. Yeah. Amazingly, I myself am a geoengineer, so ah, from, great. So, but I have a two-part question. One that you presented three worlds, and it as as if three are distinct identities, and but the three are intimately connected. Even if what happens, what we describe as a natural problem or a geoengineering problem, at, at many, in many senses, ultimate decision comes into the political arena. Mm -hmm. and we say when continental drift or animals migration, we consider that as a natural problem. But the human migration comes into the political arena. When I had a historian one time making that, well, nowhere in the world, there is so much rough considering our Mexican border that nowhere in the world there is so much of disparity, economic disparity, at so much of geographical prox proximity. And, but the point is that anything falling, any in problems in any of these world, uh, three worlds, to an extent you can solve in that world itself. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it becomes a question of the integration of the three world, and in some sense, falls very heavily into the political world. And so, you have any reflection? Uh, no, I, I, would, I would agree with that. And so, again, getting sort of more on the philosophical side, so when you think about you know, evolving notions of, 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 I would even say that the, even the, the, the notion of, of, of local now should be, should be different. Right, that it should be integrated into to global. Right, the the notion of 
self-interest or national interest should be should be. Um, so I think we're in agreement that um, I'm, I just you know had to organize the lecture in a certain way to sort of show um, various aspects of this connectivity. Uh, but I agree with you. Another thing that as I was you know going through this lecture, I was also thinking about just getting to geoengineering. Um, the migration issue and the climate issue are, you know, right? if not coming into collision already, a similar issue, right? It's sort of coming out in different ways. So uh, I think you raise a big issue, though. How do we disaggregate these, these, these challenges? You know, these are public policy problems, and um, we're going to have to have some new ways, new ways in. Um, and I think the first question sort of got to that. We're gonna, you know, there are gonna be these sort of functional problems that come up and you're gonna need to draw on different kinds of expertise to really address them. So I think we're on the same page in terms of the, the sort of integrated nature of what we're looking at. Thank you. Dr. Rosenthal, thanks for coming. Uh, you, to your point earlier about uh, ethics being the ideal, uh, you had a slide up that showed a potential, you know, Geneva Convention for right cyber connectivity, right? Right. One of the points on it said that uh, there shouldn't be targeting of tech companies and also that uh, there should be a policy of 100% defense rather than offense. Am I correct in saying that? Right, yeah. So uh, with, you know, the advent of, you know, Russian and North Korean and other rogue states, uh, I guess, engagement in cyber warfare, do you think that it is ever possible to have a 100% defensive stance in the cyber war area? Great question. Um, maybe it might be a little bit like global zero with nuclear, right? <laughs> Meaning that you have to set, you have to set you know, a, a really ambitious, strong, clear, unambiguous target to get movement in that direction. Um, I sometimes wonder whether that, that group that I showed you there that you know, are for global zero are really for complete zero, right? Um, I think the point that they're trying to make is we're so far off, you know, that we gotta set, we gotta set the target here to get closer. I don't know, I can't speak for, for Brad Smith and you know, uh, what, he, what the people in the tech sector uh, would say, um, but I think as a, as a conversation starter, it's, 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 it's attractive. Um, Realistically speaking, I guess if you um, um, if you extrapolate out um, and you look at cyber war uh, like war, you treat it like other security arrangements. Uh, you're probably likely to see right some capacities for for. Um, it's interesting because the, the, we would call it self-defense, but there's offensive capacity in a self-defense force. So. Uh, it would be an interesting, an interesting conversation. Um, the short answer is no, but again, I think right now, we're, I, I, this is an, an area that I think doesn't get enough attention. It means there's all kinds of cyber war going on right now, uh, multi-level, uh, including from the United States against others. And uh, there's, there's really no coordinating mechanism uh, for it. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, during the end of your lecture, you talked yeah. about what kind of ethics we should construct, and it seems to me in a lot of ways, ethics, at least for most of history, hasn't been constructed so much as enforced. And it seems like the most economically and politically powerful societies aren't going to be in favor of a global ethic, mm -hmm. because it may not be to their continued advantage and it seems like they have the power to enforce that. How can we mobilize the interests of the most economically advantaged societies in order to create a global ethic? Or how can we assert our power in subverting that um, idea? Great question, right? It comes down to, to power and authority. Um, and, um, you know, I come back to this is why I'm, I'm still clinging to my realist, you know, heritage in a way. Right, and I think the short answer to the question is, is, is again, this idea, I use the, the term enlightened self-interest, but that um, um, it's, it's first of all a matter of survival, but also a matter of enlightening you. Know, you've got some of these things that are, you know, they will, if you're not interested in them, they'll be interested in you. 
Uh, and so it's almost forced in that way to deal with these big global scale issues. So I, I think the hinge point is to be convincing uh, the great powers, uh, whether they be uh, traditional nation state powers or corporate power or other loci of power, um, that you know this is this is a requirement for um, uh, for healthy living and 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 um, for a future. We have, oh sorry, Tony. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so I had a question. You had mentioned in the very beginning that uh, old world perspectives, old world traditions, and their kind of solutions going about uh, combating like our, ma our our natural interests um, are going to be insufficient in the world and like age that we live right now. Right. Um, I interpreted old world more as traditional perspectives, um, but with the misconception that pragmatic, realistic solutions are considered elitist, how might we convince traditional or old world minds who are capable of inflicting real change that pragmatic realism, pluralism are not elitist solutions? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Uh, boy, I don't have a quick answer to that. Um, you know, I I think that um, yeah, well, I think that the 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 proof is in the results, right? Um, you have to you have to point to empirical you know data solutions, right? That you know these these things work, right? That if you have some kind of um, uh, governance uh, uh, mechanism or some functional government governance system that um, shows favorable results, uh, that then that's the the right direction. So, um, one of the the examples that's point to as a as a positive example of a sort of a globally functioning network that's yielding positive results will be in the public health area. Um, uh, Ebola, right? We have Ebola outbreak. Right? And there's actually some significant international capacity that's been built up through a functional system of um, um, you know, both through public security and public health uh, mechanisms that have been coordinated. And we now have a reasonable global response to an outbreak of a disease. Um, I mean, so I think you know, pointing to some examples like that to say, you know, this can be done and it benefits everybody. I think we, something along those lines, but we'd have to, have to work on that. Thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. Thanks for, so much for a wonderfully sure. comprehensive and a very stimulating uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Rosenthal. I wonder whether in terms of the previous question, you already gave one type of answer, which is someone like Henry Kissinger, the ultimate realist who now says, we have to get rid of nuclear weapons right. if, if the uh, planet is to survive. And Robert McNamara would be another, you know, the great film, The Fog of War. But of course, it's always interesting how these people come to these conclusions after they leave power. <laughs> so there is that as well. Uh, so I don't know whether enlightenment comes you know, um, uh, in a situation where power is absent. Uh, but the question I had was the, the very interesting situation you pointed out to at the beginning, which is, there is a crisis in democracy and there is a crisis in internationalism. I was just wondering what your thoughts are about the reasons for that crisis, because those reasons go to the possibility of creating the type of system that you think is necessary to deal with all the challenges that we face in the future. So what can we learn from that crisis in terms of the future of constructing an ethics to deal with the three case studies that you've uh, mentioned? Uh, so far, what can we learn from that that will help us to deal with the issues that we face? Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and you're right. I mean, there are these underlying sort of symptoms um, that that are persistent, and we've seen them before. Uh, and for somebody like me, it's sort of terrifying to see this. You know, what's happening now? It's like it's something that we've seen. Um, I'm only hesitating because it's almost a, it's almost a cliche to give the answer, but it's the only thing I, it's the only thing I got, and maybe that's why I come to places like this. But 
I think it requires education and it requires leadership. Like people have to understand, um, you know, you know you, we even see in this country, we have a populist uh, uprising uh, and yet the policies that are being pursued are, are, are not helping the, the people who are, um, you know, supporting it. So uh, I wish that maybe I should run for president. <laughs> um, no, but I think so. I don't know if it's a, you know, a way to, to sort of, uh, uh, whether it's the power of persuasion, education, or somehow speaking to the, the emotion the, that, that's not being met. I don't have the, the sort of magic formula, but I think it's also leadership. Um, I, I, I see it's short, sorely lacking. So I apologize for this answer because it's so weak, but um, I, I think your question's well taken and, and profound. Yeah. Thanks, Joel, for yeah. that wonderful talk. So as a sequel to the last question that Tony asked and your response, could, could I just make this point that it seems like <clears throat> Uh, the ethics in a connected world, for that, we have to move from nationalism to, in, to internationalism and from there to globalism. And nationalism is the narrowest domain of national interest, self-interest, national self-interest. Internationalism is when we try to join hands with other nations uh, for collective uh, sharing of interest. But that's not enough. We have to, to achieve two ethical links. Between people in the world, we have to go from nationalism to globalism, where we connect not with just nation states, but also, but especially with the citizens of those states, you know. And that's the direction, and there are lots of philosophical ideas behind each state. And it seems like at this point, with the rise of uh, right-wing populism, we're going back into the first state again, nationalism, right. with this very uh, poisonous idea of uh, some a superficially concocted uh, idea of, uh, of, uh, of, of nativism and identity. And so that's thwarting us in that direction. And so therefore, in a way, what you just said, you know, that makes very big uh, sense and that's a challenge, how we go in that direction and rather than going reverting back into the worst possible sense, that's nationalism, you know? Right. So it's more like perhaps a comment than a question, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think that that's right. And again, it's a really, it is a change of, it's a change of mindset. Um, it's a change of perception. And it goes really deep. It goes to identity. And um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what the, what that, you know, what the counterforce will be. But right now we're in this sort of fragmenting moment. And it's not self-evident what, what will be. And so I guess my appeal <clears throat> was if I, if you can't solve it by either persuasion or marketing or, or even education or whatever, but is actually this sort of a pragmatic problem-solving approach. That these problems are so urgent, they're so present, they're right there, they need to be tackled, um, and to do it on that basis, um, along with a, with a set of principles, and to sort of to sort of move out in that in that way. Because I think if we have broad philosophical questions, uh, it seems to be. You know, it's important and it's stimulating and helpful, but, um, you know, probably not going to move things um, in, a, in a positive way. Although I will say that I had a sort of a brief line in the, in the lecture about this, but it's, it's, it's sort of staggering to me sort of <clears throat> the way in which um, the term globalism, as you were using it, um, has, been, has been vilified. You know, that it's, you know, it's, either, it's either ridiculous, right, some new age thing, um, or it's, you know, it's, it's the sort of malign, you know, force from, you know, uh, uh, the, the global banking establishment, you know, uh, to make money. Uh, and it's sort of from both left and right and, and you know, up from identity and, <clears throat> you know, it's just sort of a full scale, full scale assault. I don't have the answer of, uh, of the sort of counter assault to that other than what I presented to you this evening which is we got some practical problems to work on. Let's, let's work on those. Understanding that any resolution of some of these issues will require a global coordinating mechanism. And in some of these that will, will need some kind of governing governance, even if it's a soft governance. 
to to deal with them. Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Rosenthal. Thank you for your talk. It was uh, a fantastic talk to listen to. Um, I, I want to kind of follow up on the themes uh, that uh, have been uh, you've been addressing recently about globalism, for example, right. and um, uh, from a sort of a more economic uh, uh, viewpoint. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I want to uh, address specifically uh, borders. Um, so, for example, uh, the southern border, it was essentially, I believe, a, a, an open border until the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, uh, that, at that point is when we started building walls and fences and and uh, things like that, and, and the, the effect actually, there was an unintended consequence uh, in that uh, the number of illegal immigrants in the country actually went up uh, because people could not go home anymore. Right, right. Uh, you know, in, in trying to prevent people from coming in, we right. block people from leaving the country as well. Right. Um, and uh, on a global scale, uh, I believe uh, Michael Clemens at the Center for uh, Global Development estimated that um, due to borders around the world, uh, we've left $78 trillion worth of economic development and economic activity on the table. Um, so, so I wonder if you could uh, speak to that and if we're talking about uh, a new uh, Geneva Convention, right. uh, if uh, an idea of an open border uh, somehow fits along those lines oh, as well. That's great, that's a really great question. So. Um if not open border, again, this, the mobility convention's idea of at least having some kind of regularized or routinized um, ability um, that would be more efficient um, and more sort of welfare enhancing, but also kind of more win-win kind of um, um, outcomes. But but this is really what all the trade the trade talk has been about. Um, maybe not so much U.S.-China, but certainly the the you know redoing of the NAFTA deal and um, you know what's happening in the, in Europe right now, um, you know many of the trade agreements I think are along the lines that, that you were suggesting, which is how do we think of a regime um, that that results in more uh, beneficial exchange, um, including the movement of people, the movement of goods, and um, again this is one of the shocks of the sort of the of the last three years because we thought we were actually moving in a reasonable you know a direction if not free trade it was a free trade with with certain kinds of guidelines and which which took seriously things like um, uh, human rights labor standards environmental standards and you know so these regimes were sort of moving along until the, until until they weren't so I mean I, a simple answer to your question is you know I I, I think we, we in the past have had some reasonably good ideas coming out of the post-World War II era. Um, so my own view, I'm actually sort of a simpleton when it comes to this. I think the answers are pretty there. Pretty, pretty there. I think that it's, it's political will that's, uh, that's the problem. And so, again, the question, how do you change that, is, is, a political, is a political question. But again, what I would keep coming down to is um, you know, empirical evidence you know, showing how certain trade agreements benefit certain people and actually, you know, you know, proving it that way. Um, but I, I, you know, I can't, um, I can't argue with the evidence. Um, emotion and identity and other things are, at this point, more important. So we have to figure out a way to, to, to deal with that. We got one more? Hi there. Hi. Um, I guess my question probably won't be as well articulated as some of the previous <laughs> questions. But while I guess instant action was probably something that's always preferable with these types of situations, do you see, if not, do you see generations such as mine, because I'm only 18, do you see my generation kind of moving forward with globalism, considering that we live in a, I guess we've grown up with this kind of world being connected with I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. So I am very bullish on your generation. I'm, I'm short-term pessimistic, long-term optimistic. Um, and I was just saying to somebody here in the, in the um, reception before we came in 
that I, when I used to teach um, a class on, on issues related to this, I used to have like this whole lecture on globalization and trying to prove to students that, you know, we live in this connection. They were like, come on, like, you know, let's get to the next lecture. We know that, right? I mean, so I do think that there is a generational um, shift in that sense of a sort of an acceptance of the empirical reality, the lived reality of, of the global world we live in, the connectivity of some of these problems, um, the need to work collectively to solve. I, I absolutely believe that. Um, so my, my question to myself is how do we um, hand it off to you? <laughs> Quickly before doing more damage. So. <laughs> but I do think gen I do think there's a huge generational shift, and I'm sort of waiting to see that kick in. I don't know. Do you share that? Kind of. I'm also afraid of the past living on in my generation, as I've seen kind of that yeah. divide. Yeah. So I think the biggest challenge is is one of, um, of is one of awareness and one of um, also. You know, I was talking about this idea of sort of philosophical term of human agency, of, of, of especially for younger people to feel like they can be, a, you know, be meaningfully engaged on these things. That it's not something that's distant or far or removed or too big, but that it's actually present and sort of meaningful to your personal life. We got one more. Hi. Yeah, um, hi. T t in your lecture, you described yeah. yourself at some points as a universalist and at yeah. other times as a realist. Yeah. But you also described someone who who advocated giving weapons to the Khmer Rouge because it was to our geopolitical advantage, Kissinger, uh, as a realist. So would you kind of explain how you use the term realist in the context of these problems we're facing? Sure. Yeah. No, I'm using it in a sort of classic, you know, international relations theory, you know, political science idea. The idea that um, um, both, uh, at least in the collective act, uh, collective action, like nations will act on their national interest, and that national interest is defined in terms of power, right? And that's sort of in that, in that what realists do is that's how they make their calculations. Does this increase my power or decrease my power? End of story, right? Um, so I do think that there is something, I guess my point is that there is something to that. I'm not dismissing it entirely. What I would argue about realism is that I believe that it's insufficient. And I believe to leave it there, to leave it at the Kissinger version or even the IR theory version is, it's just insufficient. I don't, it just doesn't do all the work. And I do believe that there is room within the realist idea that states will act on their interests. Or if you want to change the level individuals or other actors will act on their interests, there is still a way to think that, okay, they'll do that, but there's, there is space for these principles that I was discussing. Thank you all. Thank you. You're a great audience, very attentive. I appreciate it. Thanks.